everyone. Stephen here uh, from the Church of God in Belfast. What I want to do with you just now is go through the opening flow of Romans chapter 5 because it's one of the many passages in the New Testament that points to the fact that discipleship to the Lord Jesus, that is genuine discipleship, those who learn from him day by day as his students with the indwelling help of the Holy Spirit, genuine discipleship to the Lord Jesus Christ is transformative. It should change us. Our Christian experience in the here and now should change us and we should be active participants in that change. That's a consistent message of the New Testament uh, and particularly in Paul's writings, both here in Romans 5 that we're going to look at together, but also in Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3 and in many other beautiful passages that give us hope of transformation in the here and now. God is at work in us to transform us and we should be active participants in that work. So I want to read just now with you the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 5. Let's go. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We begin in a crucial place with verse 1. It's the beginning of any meaningful life with God. We are justified that is, declared to be righteous, declared to be in the right with God by faith. What does that mean? Well, through placing our confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ, through trusting him fully, we are made right with God. Trusting him, who he is, all that he taught, all that he's done for us at the cross in bearing our sins, in his resurrection and in his ascension and all that that means for us right now. Trusting him fully, leaning our confidence on him for our life. And we have peace with God, peace with our maker, a life with him, which is what we were made for. Now, through trusting Jesus, Paul goes on to say, we also have our introduction into this grace in which we stand. Now, what is grace? Grace, I suggest, is not simply to do with salvation but it is to do with the very fabric of our lives as disciples. Someone has said that grace is God giving us what we don't deserve and that's absolutely true. I would add that it is God acting in our lives to do what we can't do on our own and so those who are living in daily interaction with God are drawing on his grace moment by moment. As I live each day doing things with God, including God in the things that I have before me each day, I am living a grace-filled life. So you see that interaction with God isn't a one-off thing that we do when we're made right with him at salvation and then we don't have to concern ourselves with him again uh, until we die. Rather, we are now standing in a state of grace. We are living in a new reality with God, in which we draw on his resources, 
his infinite resources for our help moment by moment. That's wonderful. And Paul says, we exult in hope of the glory of God. Exulting is feeling elated about something. It's uh, being filled up with a sense of joy about something. And in this case, we are filled with joy about the hope that we have of the glory of God. What's Paul talking about? Well, first of all, I think it's interesting in this passage that he makes the assumption that all Christians will be living like this. He states it as a, a plain fact. We exult. Brothers and sisters, it's what we do. And it's exulting in the hope of something. Biblical hope is not an uncertain thing where we think, I hope this might happen, but I know it might not. Um, rather, what the Bible means by hope is allowing the certainty of what is going to happen in the future to shape us now. So we know that our future is good through God's grace, eternally good. And that should shape us in the here and now. We need to allow it, that to shape us in the here and now. And I speak to myself there uh, very much too. The hope that Paul is speaking about is in the glory of God. Now, what's he referring to? Let me give you three answers to that, but there are lots more, probably. Um, the first is in Colossians 3. Uh, Paul says, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So one of the things that we should exalt about now is the hope that we will see the Lord Jesus revealed in glory. And not only that, but we will also be revealed with him as glorious. Paul's speaking about the transformation of our bodies uh, to be like his glorious resurrected body when we see him. The full redemption uh, he speaks about elsewhere. It's a wonderful hope of the glory of God that we should exult in right now. Second, uh, in Romans 8, Paul speaks about the whole of creation, which is currently groaning. We see that today, don't we, in so many ways. The whole of creation will be, Paul says, set free into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So another thing that we should exult about now is the hope that we have of creation itself being freed and made perfect, of the natural order of the world being set right when it experiences the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And thirdly, uh, Paul says in Philippians 2 that there is a time coming when every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that will be to the glory of God the Father. So those are some examples of how we exult right now in hope of the glory of God. We have a sense of joy when we think about what is coming associated with the glory of God, the glory of the Father, the glory of his Son, and of our own revealing as glorious beings because of him, and even uh, of the glory of creation itself being set free. From verse 3, Paul launches into a really important section in Romans 5 that speaks about our maturing, our character development, our transformation as disciples of the Lord Jesus. So he says that we don't only exult in hope of the glory of God, but we also exult in our tribulations. There is something about living life in interaction with God, in this state of grace that allows us to exult in our tribulations, in our difficulties and our sufferings. And it's this, that we know and have confidence that God has a grand purpose and also that he is working in our lives to accomplish a particular purpose for us. And everything that comes our way is from his hand and ultimately for that purpose. And that purpose, in broad strokes, is that we might become like Jesus in our character. He's the most wonderful person. And the thought of becoming more like him should excite us. The perspective of God using difficult times in our lives to make us more like the Lord Jesus should even give us a sense of joy. 
because being like him is of supreme value. He is the best at living. He showed it here when he was on the earth and we can be like him. So difficult times in our lives bring about perseverance as we experience them with God. We need to acknowledge that sometimes suffering can lead to other outcomes. Perhaps we've seen people turn away from God and exclude him as a result of suffering. But I suggest to you that as we experience suffering in a life lived with God, interacting closely with him, it produces perseverance. Perseverance brings about proven character, a steady, reliable response of character, a change at the level of our character, which is a very deep thing. And proven character brings about hope. And there we have hope again. So we began in exulting in hope of the glory of God and we come full circle to hope again. Hope produces hope in God's purposes and it doesn't disappoint. Hope doesn't disappoint, Paul says, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Hope doesn't disappoint because we grasp with the help of God's Spirit something of the love that he has shown to us. And when we understand something of that love, we can be sure about his commitment to us now and eternally into the future. So this is a really important link in the passage. Understanding his love for us is the basis of our hope. And then the thrust of the last few verses from 6 to 11 is a joy for us because it's really underlining the nature of that love that has been poured out into our hearts. The nature of the love of God. And in fact, the nature of all genuine love is this. It gives rather than takes. It gives rather than takes. And so Paul speaks about God's love. That while we could never have helped ourselves, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, he gave his everything. He gave his life to buy us back for God. That God has reconciled us to himself through the death of his son while we were enemies, while we were rebels. So how much more, now that we actually belong to him, will he bless us? If he loved us enough to die for us while we were against him, how much more can we be sure of his love Now that we're on his side, as it were. And if the death of the Lord Jesus has done so much for us, and it has, how much more is he doing for us in his resurrected and endless life? You know, I think verse 10 is a really deep verse. Um, I'll just read it again to you. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I've not heard many people talk about this verse much. Uh, I've seen a few different approaches to it by commentators. And one is linked to Hebrews 7, where the writer in the Hebrews says, uh, He is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He is alive forever. And we are inextricably identified with him now. So he's always there to help us and always there to deliver us. So Paul says, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Another angle on verse 10 that I've seen is that the life of the Lord Jesus, as it is manifested in us now, as we are transformed to become more like him, delivers us from the power of sin in our lives. So we sometimes talk about being saved from sin in three aspects. Uh, We've been saved from the penalty of sin through the death of the Lord Jesus and justified by his resurrection. Um, But we are currently being saved from the power of sin in our lives to the extent that we are conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the extent that his life is manifested in us right now. Remember what Paul said. It's no longer I who live, 
but Christ who lives in me. And finally, we will yet be saved from the presence of sin when the Lord Jesus returns. Um, and at that moment when creation is set free to into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So, having been reconciled to God through the death of his son, we shall be saved by his life, both as he lives to make intercession for us and also as that life of Christ is manifested in us now, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Verse 11 uh, then was the last one that we read. Again, it's about exulting. Not only this, Paul says, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We have a sense of joy in God himself. I almost don't need to say more than that. Again, it's Paul's assumption in this passage that disciples of the Lord Jesus will have joy in God. We exult in God. Where are we in that? The joy in God comes from or is through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because if we want to know what God is like, if we want to know God, we look at the Lord Jesus and we get to know him. We find our joy in him and we'll find it in God. So you can see that Paul has brought us some distance here from being justified through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and having peace with God through the development of our character to someone whose life is saturated with joy in God. So perhaps I can finish uh, by just highlighting those three aspects of joy for us to go away and practice. Uh, because joy is something that we need to practice. We need to actually do uh, as a discipline in our lives, just like hope. Hope is something we need to practice consciously, intentionally each day. And these are those aspects of joy. Joy and hope of the glory of God. Bring it to mind each day and rejoice in it. Joy in tribulation, that's a hard one for us. But because we know that God has a purpose in all things and he's working out that purpose, we can have joy in tribulation and joy in God himself through knowing and enjoying our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's practice those aspects of joy in our lives and be those who exult in hope, in tribulation, in God himself.